As always, all thoughts and opinions here are my own. Oppos the Audio Store did send this out for a review. Heifman had nothing to do with this review. So let's go ahead and jump into it. This is the EF400. This is a very interesting amplifier because not only does Heifman not really come out with very many amplifiers, but when they do, it kind of marks an interesting point. This is replacing the 2012 EF6. Now, what's interesting about this one to me personally is that this is sort of a, a nudging of people to redefine how much power they think they need for some headphones like Susvara or like the HE1000 V2, which I have right here. And I think that Susvara doesn't actually need as much power as a lot of people wanna make it seem like it needs, but this is still a very powerful amplifier coming in at about 4.4 watts per channel. But it's nowhere near some of the like claims of 10 watts or 50 watts or 100 watts. People use speaker amplifiers sometimes for things like Susvaras. I don't personally think that you need it. And it doesn't seem that Heifman thinks that you need that much either. Now, I do think that this is even more interesting than that, mostly because of how different and alternative this amplifier feels to some existing DAC amps that are in the market right now. A very competitive market, might I add, by the way. And we'll be talking about some of those competitors. One of the things that's really interesting about this is the use of an R2R DAC inside this. This has a Himalayan R2R DAC. Apparently, this is the same DAC that's in the Heifman Diva. Though I'm not sure if they're implemented in the same way. I would be surprised if they literally took that entire DAC and put it in here. Either way, an R2R DAC inside of a DAC amp is a rarity. Most DAC amps right now are either using ESS or AKM chips. This also has a very interesting selection of inputs being only two USBs. One is a USB-B and the other one is a USB Type-C. Now I commend them for using USB Type-C because for some reason this seems to be something that no other DAC amp can get right, even on really high-end ones. Uh, they don't provide USB-C, which has become the industry standard for everything else outside of DACs, it seems. Even my camera has USB-C on it. So this is going to be fine for some people and also restrictive for some other people. I am a USB a user for my audio interface, so this is perfectly fine. In fact, this actually offers some redundancy, which is kind of funny. But if you use optical or Bluetooth or anything like that, this is gonna not be for you, obviously. This is an area where this steps quite a bit behind some of the competition for feature set. Now, I can't speak on the internal build quality because I just don't know enough about it, but the external build quality is superior to that of Topping right now, that of uh, even Fio. It's just a little bit better. It feels more dense, more solid, and seems to be better constructed, honestly. I also like the physical design of it, especially the face being this brushed aluminum look that actually looks pretty decent and seems to match some of the other Heifman headphones very, very well for their brushed aluminum look. You have a four gain selection switch. Then you have a host of headphone outputs being 6.3 millimeter, 3.5 millimeter, 4.4 mil balanced and of course XLR balance, and then you have your volume knob. The volume knob does feel a little bit cheap actually. I do wish that it felt a little bit better. And then your outputs on the back for your DAC are simply XLR and RCA, and for inputs and outputs, that's it. You have USB input, the chassis itself is a little bit of a fingerprint magnet, so be aware of that. But overall design I think is uh, very, very nice looking. But of course that's gonna be user to user. So the measurements are sort of interesting. A total harmonic distortion is 0.002%. The SNR is 118 dB and the power output is about 4.4 watts. This hasn't been independently measured, so I'm not sure if there's going to be any real corks in this thing's uh, measurement performance. But what's interesting about this is that it's already a little bit behind uh, some of the existing measurement DAC amps right now. Those like the DX5 and the, the FIO K9, for example. Now, the interesting thing about this is that I think it's actually targeted towards a different audience than the people who like a super squeegee clean measuring DAC amp. And mostly I say that because of the introduction and the choice of use of the R2R DAC, which historically don't measure quite as cleanly as something like an AKM chip or an ESS chip. So we could sit here and argue about measurements all day, but it also doesn't seem like that's necessarily what it's trying to go for. If it is, it doesn't compete. It is not as well measuring as some of the existing DAC amps right now. If you're looking for something that measures basically perfectly and better than this does, you can look at something like that DX5 or that K9 that I mentioned before and we'll be comparing to later. Now, an interesting thing on the power here and where this is somewhat different from some of the existing DAC amps that are on the market right now is that this is more powerful than those. Um, this has probably just about as much as any headphone is going to need. And that alone is going to be very attractive to the right users. 
Um, this also has a lot of flexibility, so it can play with IEMs. You know, if you want to knock this all the way down to its lowest gain mode and play with IEMs, this thing sounds really, really good like that. Uh, but if you want to flick it up to its high gain mode and play a Susvara or a V2 or an HE6, you're also going to be able to do that. So for somebody with a wide range of headphones, um, the power output is going to be very appealing. So it seems like Heifman has defaulted to people who have a, a following for things like R2R DAX um, or people who are going to really lean towards a more subjective sound signature for their amplifiers. And that's where the subjective portion of this review comes in. I think that this thing is very good for certain headphones and misses the mark a little bit for others. For example, on this HE1000 V2, I thought this was a fantastic pairing with a balanced cable. Not only does that headphone require a lot of power, but I actually felt like this amp was overpowered for it in a good way. Like it, it had more than enough for it. I'd never really got this thing over 12 o'clock on the dial, which is very impressive for a big demanding planar headphone like that one. But I felt like this was really able to drive it's a dynamic slam in the bass response for the headphone, which is usually what suffers first. It was able to slam in a very similar way to that of the A90D, which I also like a lot. So that was impressive to see. Another thing that this headphone suffers from quickly with different amplifiers is sort of a, a glossiness or a, a shininess to the treble response because it's already a pretty treble forward headphone. And you can get this glaze on the treble with some less resolving DAC amps. And this one, I actually felt like sounded better than the better measuring K9. I felt like this was a little bit smoother on the top end. I don't know about better resolving. Some headphones that this didn't sound really good with was actually the Diana TC. In a weird way, uh, it actually felt like it made that headphone a little bit more mono um, and not quite as three dimensional as it can usually sound on uh, things like my A90 and D90 stack. And on that headphone, it actually made that seem a little bit more uh, compressed for the sound. It didn't feel quite as dynamic and alive as it can with something like the A90. I'm not sure if this is a power difference between the A90 um, and the EF400, um, or if there's other factors that are going into play here, but uh, yeah, I didn't quite like it so much on that particular headphone. Some more common headphones like the Heifman's Edition XS, I felt like the performance was as good as I've, I've heard on this thing. Um, it matched the capability, in my opinion, of something like the uh, A90 or the A90D. And that's a relatively easy headphone to drive, um, but still you will hear amplification differences on that headphone and this one sounded really good. Now, as far as any characteristics that stood out to me, um, this doesn't seem like an overly warm amplifier, it, nor like a squeegee clean, like a very clinical one. It kind of just hit right in the middle. It didn't seem to have any particular leanings, which is uh, a good thing and a bad thing. I wish since they weren't really going for measurements that they would sort of lean in a warmer direction. I think that would be my personal preference, but they didn't seem to do that. It's kind of generally what I would consider to be kind of middle of the road. Other than that, I didn't really notice any standout characteristics that would make me not recommend this to somebody, um, especially if you're not really interested in doing the whole measurement dance. It sounded very clear and without characteristics that I would typically uh, look for as a detriment to it. It sounded quite nice. So right now these are the competition and I'm not really going to say anything new that I haven't already said here, but I do want to wrap it up in a nice little package here. Basically, these things offer more features and better measurements. Now, as far as subjective listening tests so far, I have no problem recommending the EF400 if you're fine with the limited feature set, but the high amount of power and the, you know, the, the looks, of course, the IO. If you're a measurement chaser, though, it's clear that you're either going to be deciding between the K9 and the DX5. Um, I think all three of these sound about the same, except when you get into some bigger planars. I actually felt like the Diana TC was better on the DX5 than it was the EF400, but I felt like the HE1K V2 sounded better on the EF400 than it did on either of the others. So it's really a matter of like which particular headphone you're talking about, in my opinion, um, for which one sounds better. So the basic argument breaks down to do you want more power or do you want better specs and better features? Those are your decisions. I think these are the three options in this price tag that I would really recommend. And it would really just depend on what you need from your DAC camp. All right, guys, thanks a lot for watching. Catch you in the next video. Bye.